Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted on behalf of City Forum to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of our defence, security and resilience work in 2021-2022, uh, which we've prepared with a load of advice from the MOD, particularly from DCDC, uh, guidance from the NSA in Washington, and with the great support of BA Systems Applied Intelligence, without whose sponsorship we wouldn't be able to run this particular series at all. Our theme today is addressing urgent issues for the UK, the US and their allies, and the opening discussion this afternoon is facing up to China. And we're delighted to have Frank Kramer returning to guide our discussion. He chairs our uh, events remarkably well, and, and we're delighted that he's willing to return to us. On the panel, we open with a very old friend of City Forum, Chris Inglis, who, when he was deputy director of, uh, of NSA, opened a very interesting uh, area of work for us, which we greatly enjoyed for at, at least 12 years now, uh, looking at cyber questions. Chris can only be with us for 30 minutes because of his diary. So he's going to do a short speech with a couple of questions to follow. And these are going to come from Paul Kilworth, uh, Chief Scientific Advisor for National Security, Deputy Chief Scientific Advisor, and Paul Spedding of BA Systems, who helps us in developing these programs. Uh, after uh, the, this, this, the session with, with Chris, Paul Kilworth will then speak at greater length. And we're then delighted to have Isabel Hilton uh, back with us to speak about China. We always look forward to her sort of interventions with great enthusiasm. We then go on to Joyce Correll, whom we haven't had on our programs for years, and we're particularly pleased, Joyce, to have you back in this particular discussion. The panel comments will be on the record, then Frank will start uh, the round table uh, discussion, which will be sort of off the record to permit an, as open and free a conversation as possible. Uh, at the end of the whole series, um, I shall with um, Paul Cornish, our chief strategist, uh, produce a report with any thoughts on what has usefully come out of these sessions that 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 might be helpful in the development of strategy and in the development of of ways of working and actually sort of doing things. Um, and uh, that that re re report that summary uh, will be prepared under Chatham House uh, rule arrangements. We need to finish by fifteen fifteen this afternoon when there'll be a 20 minute uh, sort of gap between this first session and the second one, which uh, uh, will will follow when we go on to effect in the gray zone against China and other competitors. Anybody who's attending the first, we would be delighted to see them at the second. Um, to, to start our, um, our engagement this afternoon, we have Frank in the chair and Chris to give our, um, sort of give the opening speech I can't see a better start, it wouldn't be possible. And we have a full house and we're, de and we're de delighted to have you both to open our event. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Um, and good morning and good afternoon to all those here uh, and in the audience, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, the topic, as Mark indicated, uh, focuses on China, uh, but it's on, in an underlying uh, consideration, as the title indicated, of defense, security, and resilience, uh, and the key issues for the UK, uh, the US, and allies. We've got, as Mark indicated, outstanding speakers, but let me give a short framework, which the audience might keep in mind or might disagree with, uh, as to how to look at some of the issues. And the underlying point I'd like to make is that in an important sense, all the issues with China become more fraught uh, because of defense issues, uh, because of the potential military consequences that might occur uh, if certain things went wrong in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, as this audience is really quite well aware, the United States has a longstanding policy, and not only that, but statutory requirements to assure Taiwan as efficient self-defense. And that's obviously an area of considerable uh, focus these days. China's actions in the South 
China Sea, and particularly in the East China Sea, uh, raise consequential concerns for Japan, uh, the Senkaku Islands, and the United States has repeatedly indicated that the Senkaku Islands fall underneath the U.S.-Japan alliance. So again, a potential uh, area of confrontation. Uh, other points can be made with respect to China's military activities. Uh, one can look at, for example, the growth of their budget. Uh, we can look at the expected growth uh, with respect to nuclear capabilities. I mentioned the South China Sea uh, and various clashes that they've had uh, in recent years, for example, on the border with India. So all these concerns uh, on defense play over into other kinds of issues, whether they're economic or technological and the like, uh, cyber espionage activities in space. Since we're here in the UK, it's important to underscore uh, what allies are doing. Of course, uh, first and foremost, uh, one wants to look at the so-called AUKUS agreement, Australia, the United Kingdom, and the US. Uh, the clear subject with respect to that area, of course, is nuclear submarines. But perhaps even more importantly, uh, over time, it may be that the technological cooperation uh, will be of highest consideration. Other consequential issues, which I'm sure the presenters will explore, uh, include cyber espionage, economic coercion, technological issues such as China's military civil policy, supply chains, uh, domestically, the dual circulation approach to economics, and of course, the ever increasing role of the Communist Party inside of China, including uh, with respect to so called private businesses. Uh, Mark has already indicated. Um, that we uh, will start with Chris uh, because he has limited time and have a few questions afterwards. Um, during the webinar, uh, only the speakers are gonna be visible. Um, they'll speak in turn according to the agenda that you all have. Uh, and then we'll go into the discussion as Mark said. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, please put them in the chat function, direct them to me, and I will do my very best to make sure that they get to the presenters. Um, and during the second session, uh, that will be, that is to say, after the speakers have all spoken and went to the questions, that will be on Chatham House rules, which is to say, uh, you can use the subject matter there, but not attribute it to anyone. The first session where the speakers are speaking uh, and Chris's presentations and questions uh, will be on the record. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm delighted to uh, turn over to Chris, as, as Mark has already said, he's, had, he's the United States first national cyber director. He's had a remarkably distinguished career, uh, including at the National Security Agency and other activities as well. Uh, one of the things I think I really am glad he did, he taught at the Naval Academy. Um, and he knows the subject uh, as well and better than anyone in the world. So great speaker, Chris, uh, let me turn it over to you at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Frank. Um, it's a pleasure and privilege to be introduced by you, particularly Frank. Your previous work in formulating and implementing international defense, political, military policy, combined with your more recent scholarship on various cyber matters, your 2019 cybersecurity changing the model um, kind of comes to mind, continues to be both foundational and inspirational. Um, to the members of the larger conference, I thank you for the opportunity to speak today on one of this event's major themes, the challenges posed by China and malign actors associated therewith. There's no doubt these challenges are amongst the most important in modern foreign policy and the economic discourse. I'm, I'm particularly pleased to be speaking along so many distinguished colleagues, past and present. Um, present company accepted, City Forum has done an extraordinary service in providing both the venue and the masterclass on the topics that will be discussed today. In my remarks today, though, I, I'd like to take the opportunity to propose that we complement the needed discussion on China by considering an approach to this topic from a different angle. The debate around our competition with China rightfully concerns itself with the danger of ceding our advantages in innovation, economic, diplomatic strength, even military modernization. But we must also be careful to not focus on these seers so intently that we inadvertently cede our agency to China um, and others who perhaps too often enjoy the status of first movers as they encroach upon the legitimate interests of others. And while cyber is but one dimension of many, um, it serves as both an exemplar and a bellwether of the larger set of collaborations, competitions, and conflicts 
in China's relationship with the US, the UK, and others. Um, the threats from cyberspace, including from malign actors associated with China, are real, urgent, and in some cases, severe. But again, the point I'd like to make is when considering how to prioritize and confront these threats, we should also consider first and foremost, affirmatively and intentionally, what we want cyberspace to be for. Many will recall the dawn of the digital age some 30 or more years ago as a time that was suffused with optimism and ambition. We thought that it was the inevitable conclusion of a post-World War trend of democratization and liberalization. And while we realized some, if not many, of those heady early hopes, certainly in the capabilities of the technologies themselves, other aspirations, like the ability of individuals to make unchallenged use of a free and open internet, and for whole societies to have confidence in processes and critical functions dependent on digital infrastructure and data flows, uh, those aspirations have been subverted and tainted by criminal actors and authoritarianism, um, which adapted better than we expected and learned how to twist digital connectivity and the internet to its own ends. The lesson from this unfortunate chain of events is not that all good things will be subverted, but that in order to retrieve the initiative that's long been ceded to malign actors, we must be deliberate and focused about the good things we want to realize and protect from subversion. What do we want to accomplish in cyberspace? What communities do we want to build? What values do we want to strengthen? What markets should we enable? What innovation do we want to unleash? What is necessary to project and protect those ambitions are we organized to project and protect those ambitions rather than cede the initiative to those who would hold those ambitions at risk? Uh, we need to make sure that we've got sufficient momentum, resilience, and robustness left of those events which deter us, where we can, in fact, set the course, set the initiative, set the momentum um, as we so see fit. The mere fact that malign actors seek to hurt us only matters to the extent that they can. Their motivations and activities, be they in China or elsewhere, only matter to us to the extent that they impede where we want to go or what we want to do. This may sound Pollyannish, but in fact, if we don't establish our initiative, our destination, um, then we will in fact have ceded the initiative to those who would define a different future. While our defense should not provoke or stimulate an offensive rejoinder, I want malign actors to stall on the wall of our collective defense. I want them to exhaust themselves with futility in the face of our resilience. But most of all, we should want and deliver the future that the digital revolution promised and consider that malign actors only matter to the extent that they are in the way. To do this, we, of course, need to better understand our adversaries. We also need to do a better job of understanding our aspirations, our friends, and the means by which the two can create a positive, compelling force of its own. And, that, and in that effort, we should find the following. Collaboration breeds coherence. Coordination breeds professional intimacy. Professional intimacy will enable implicit, inherent collective defense through the agility that it lends to synchronized actions that are at once reflexive and coherent in a domain where scripted responses and divisions of effort offer only inflexibility and seams that fall in the face of relentless attack. Stepping back and summing up what I'm calling for, what I think we should do is to describe a shared vision and shared values in as large a collaboration as we can muster to strengthen old partnerships and to build new ones. We should seize back the initiative from transgressors by focusing on what we want to do by, with, and through cyberspace, building in resilience across technology, people, and doctrine, roles and responsibilities, collaboratively defending the resulting architecture, which at best is defensible, not secure, and aligning actions to consequences such that there are both consequences for good behaviors and consequences for bad behaviors. We too often focus only on the latter. As our friends in the UK have shown in their NCSC, their National Cybersecurity Center, and their recently uh, released cyber strategy, this will take unprecedented private-public collaboration. Uh, the removal of what I describe as proactive ambivalence, this idea that everyone understands now that cyber is an issue, that there might in fact be a problem in cyberspace, but many of us think it's somebody else's problem to solve. Uh, we need to remove that ambivalence. We need a more equitable distribution of responsibility throughout the cyber ecosystem where every individual, every organization, every sector, every like-minded government has a role. Gone are the days when we can, if we could ever, rely on champions who have the term IT or cyber in their job title to sally forth and defend our interest while the rest of us stand idly by. I think what we need to achieve is a world where everyone knows their part, everyone knows where we're going, 
Everyone has a positive aspiration of that, but a realistic mindset um, where we essentially can make it such that if you're a transgressor in that space, you got to beat all of us to beat one of us or in a more positive vein, all of us can and must contribute to the defense of each of us. Um, those are my opening remarks. I'm delighted to be with you. Um, I wish I could stay through the rest of the day. There's quite a lot that I could or would learn from that. Um, but unfortunately, I'll have to leave in the next half hour. So I'm open to your questions, um, of which I would be delighted to engage in the discourse and possibly provide some insights about what we're doing here. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. That's, that's really uh, a vision that I think uh, on the positive side is all too often forgotten uh, in these days uh, where there are lots of issues. And maybe it underscores the point that your title is National Cyber Director, not National Cyber Security Director. So definitely looking at, at the broader approach, uh, uh, including collaboration, positive aspirations, uh, and responsibility across the board for all of us. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, open up to uh, the first set of questions. Uh, and uh, Paul Kelworth, uh, uh, let me uh, ask you to uh, direct a question to Chris. Thanks, Chris. That was a really inspirational account. And I think it's a, a powerful reminder of why being such a, a valued friend uh, to the UK and the uh, national security community here over many years. Um, I wonder if I can sort of touch on how we best implement that in a fragmented world with busy narratives, disinformation, many challenges. How do we build that consensus to act in practice? How do we build that shared urgency, that sense of shared risk? and shared responsibility to take forward that agenda across the multinational community. Yeah, so many have heard me say this before, but I'll repeat it since I think it uh, it's a commendation of UK um, insights on this and practice. Um, so in, in the world of cyber, um, the, the UK has created this thing called the National Cyber Security Center, which I think is masterful in so much as it turns the idea of collaboration almost on its head. Uh, for too long, collaboration has been based upon if I determine that there's something I think is of value to you, given what limited insights I have about what you're trying to do, um, and, the, and the only knowledge I have is what I know, then I'll push something across. But because it's special to me, and I think it's special to you, I'll take my time to make sure that I properly sanitize it um, to make sure that the germ of that idea is, proceeded, is, is pushed across. Uh, as I'm kind of cartooning that, you can clearly see there's a time delay and there's certainly some kind of ignorance on both parties' part about asking the wrong questions, providing the wrong information. That's not a model for collaboration. That's a model for information sharing of the old sort, which imagines that we have divisions of effort based upon limited insights and the stovepipes that we enjoy. Um, we perhaps try to discern what might be useful across the boundaries of those stovepipes. So let's break those down. Let's essentially put people together in a close space, be that physical or virtual, where they can co-discover, co-mitigate um, against problems of common concern. And we clearly have problems of common concern between the UK, the US, and other like-minded nations. We clearly have places like the National Cybersecurity Center or other areas which focus on other domains where we can perhaps understand in that collective problem what shards, shreds, insight, hunches do we have on either side and form those uh, perhaps insights collectively understand what that problem is together at the lowest possible level, not the highest possible level. That professional intimacy then begets relationships that go, grow the stronger as the contingency rises um, as opposed to trying to figure out how to form those relationships in the midst of a full-flown conflagration. I think that's where we need to go on this. Discussions of the sort that occur at City Forum are those moments when the sun is shining for us to actually figure out what we hold in common, how to actually create those relationships, which then grow stronger as the crisis rises. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, a second question, uh, Paul Spedding, uh, if you'd like to direct a question towards Chris. Hello, Chris, um, and thought provoking. Thank you very much. Uh, revisiting perhaps what we want from cyberspace. You emphasized collaboration. Uh, would you be able to say a little on how you might see the landscape unfolding with regard to say collaboration and, and indeed the roles between defense and security industries, the big commercial tech companies and government, if we are to create a more cohesive an agile national cyber defense capability? Yeah, so I think there are three um, kind of transformations that need to be um, undertaken and, and some of those are underway. And again, um, counterparts like the UK, the Israelis, others have uh, begun to lead these. 
The first is to reimagine what the relationship between the private and the public sector is in the, in the realm of cyberspace. Um, it has to be a collaborative relationship as opposed to a division of effort relationship. That's particularly hard here in the United States, less so other places. Um, second, um, as a byproduct of that, we need to imagine that the government is no longer the, the principal purveyor of the instruments of power that are going to be useful in the space. It's the private sector. So the private sector is the supported organization. The public sector is going to be the supporting organization. That's not to say that there are places where there's unilateral or perhaps governmental action that's required, the use of legal remedies, diplomatic remedies, so on and so forth. But for the most part, most of the work is going to take place. Most of the discernment is going to take place in the private sector. Um, the third part is that if we kind of glom onto this idea that we need to figure out where we want to go as opposed to where we're being withheld from, then we're going to have to focus more on resilience and robustness. We're going to have to get away from this idea that we can pat ourselves on the back because of the magnificent response we've collectively had over the last month to something called Log4j, which really is just waiting around for a problem to occur. And then we kind of like a fire drill, we run to it. We can't think that we, we, our success is based upon how we respond to two alarm or four alarm fires. Our success is going to be based upon avoiding them in the first place. I was an Air Force pilot for a very long time, meaning I was happy once. But there was an old saw there that said a good pilot can get out of any scrape. A, a better pilot avoids them in the first place. We need to do that. Um, and in that regard, we need to think of cyber um, or cybersecurity not as a cost, but as an enabler. Uh, Jeff Moss of kind of DEF CON and Black Hat fame has this great quote. He asks, why do race cars have bigger brakes? Um, it's not for any other reason than they can go faster. Right. We need to think of cyber in the same way. Why do we have cyber? Not for its own sake, not to defend digital infrastructure, but rather to enable mission. If we think of it that way, we'll get left of the event and we'll double down on the investments required to create inherent resilience and robustness. And the collaborative relationships will then defend that defensible enterprise, which will never be secure, will never defend itself in and of itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chris, I think uh, I'm just mindful of your time. Um, and I think uh, we'd love to keep you here as long as we could, the next two or three hours, perhaps. But uh, I know that you need to uh, get off. So let me uh, thank you a great deal uh, for presenting. I, I really want to uh, encourage the audience to think uh, affirmatively during this session uh, as to what Chris has said, uh, the need for resilience and the like. Uh, but in order to generate positive activities uh, in cyberspace. And secondly, the fact that the private sector, uh, to put it in military terms, is the supported command and the governments, if you will, are the supporting commands. Uh, and how to encourage that um, throughout, I think, is uh, two enormously important issues that we ought to talk about further. So without uh, further ado, and, and uh, Again, as I said, mindful of your time. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Chris. And we will uh, move on to uh, the rest of the speakers. Uh, if I, if you're able to stay, I, I can add questions, but I just wanted to, uh, as I said, be mindful. I yeah, know I'm mindful of the time, and I think we really want to get on to some of the experts, the real experts. And so thank you very much for the time spent this morning. I'll look forward to reading the proceedings and, and learning a bit more. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, so with that, and I did get a question in the chat uh, as to whether uh, this session's on the record, and yes, it is. Um, so with that, uh, let me turn to the speakers. Uh, you all have the agenda. Um, uh, we'll start with uh, Paul Kilworth, uh, then we'll go to uh, Isabel Hilton, uh, and then to Joyce Carell. Um, each of them will speak for uh, several minutes, um, and then we will uh, open it up to uh, questions and answers. Uh, their speeches, just again to clarify, uh, are on the record. And it's not until we get into the Q&A uh, session that uh, we'll go to Chatham House Rules. Uh, so with that, uh, Paul, uh, if, yes, there you are. <laughs> okay, Paul, over to you. Hi, and uh, thank you for having me here today, uh, Frank and Mark. And a huge thanks to Chris for those uh, very insightful comments and astute answers. Uh, a great start to what should be an excellent afternoon's discussions. Um, so where Chinese ambitions can most concern us? I was uh, considering this question last night in preparation for this event. There are many ways in which one could approach addressing this theme, but in my role as the Deputy Chief Scientific Advisor for National Security, I'll focus on some of the science and technology aspects of the question, building perhaps on our Chris's uh, thoughts around cyber. 
The recent UK integrated review recognised that we're living through a period in which rapid technological change has been combined with systemic competition, both between states and between political systems, the open democracies and authoritarian governments of the world, such as China. The security challenges we are now facing have been brewing for many years. We've been discussing the implications of China's technological rise, first in private, then in small groups, and now increasingly in public, such as this. And versions of the same debate are being held in the UK, Europe, North America, and across the Indo-Pacific. What values do we care about? What systems do we construct? Whose worldview is embodied in the next generation of emerging technologies? But debates ultimately must reach a conclusion. And I argue that we're now reaching a moment of choice in many areas of science and technology. Governments, private companies, and civil society are facing real choices about how they approach these issues in so many cases brought into sharp relief by the continuing rise of China. So what keeps, keeps me awake at night regarding China? I'm going to pull out three themes, how we must think about, protect, and develop technology in response. So first, how we think about technology. Beijing, London, Washington, we're all competing for leadership in very similar areas. The next generation of telecommunications, quantum engineering, smart city technologies, biosecurity, digital currencies, more so than ever before, it can be impossible to separate those technologies from the way we live, our daily experiences, our choices and decisions, and the value derived from the dominant political systems behind them are baked into those technologies as they're designed. It matters if a technology is designed in Shanghai or the west coast of the US or much closer to home in Manchester or Strathclyde. Smart city technology designed under an autocratic state, for example, will rarely protect individual privacy rights by default, Instead, it's likely to promote surveillance and the powers of the regime. And I'm sure that Isabel will be exploring China and data in more detail in a few minutes. The stakes in that competition for technology leadership then are higher than ever before. The consequences are not simply of interest to defense and security circles or prosperity departments, but to every citizen. Technology is no longer something we simply fight with. Its design and future is something worth fighting for. My second theme then was how we protect our technology. In a world where technology determines national success, we should be worrying ever more about how we safeguard our know-how, skills, and networks. We've already explored through Chris some of the challenges of cybersecurity. That's vital. For more than a decade, the UK has been investing in world-class cybersecurity. We've been prepared to call out China when their cyber activities threaten us. The latest year UK national cyber strategy, which Chris spoke warmly of, outlines how we'll be using our country's cyber power to advance our national goals, including the protection of our science base. But increasingly, the threat surrounds broader economic security and automatic reg regimes willing to exploit their growing economic power in predatory ways. And as we warned last year, China has been deliberately targeting those working in the UK government, industries, and research of areas of interest to the Chinese state. There is, of course, a challenge here. Science is inherently social, international. As one US industrialist once said, you cannot afford to simply lock the laboratory door. There's simply too much information waiting outside it. The UK must remain open for innovation, collaboration, and trade. We are building solutions. The uh, latest uh, National Security Investment Act in the UK, for example, or uh, the CPNI System of Trusted Research, but protecting our technology in this new age will remain challenging and require innovative solutions with partners. And my third th th uh, element then, how we develop technology. China's rise has been accompanied by huge investment in strategic technologies over many years by Beijing, com accompanied by a determination and a clear strategy to overtake the US, UK and our al allies in key well-publicized sectors. As a result, we can no longer take our sustained dominance in any technological area for granted. As one UK agency head, head said last year, Without action, it's increasingly clear that the key technologies on which we rely for our future prosperity and security won't be shaped and controlled by the West. We're now facing a moment of reckoning. We must respond successfully to that challenge and the threat posed by potential adversaries, an intent reflected in the recent integrated review, which has uplift almost £700 million for national security R&D, alongside the wider nearly £15 billion, I think, of funding for R&D announced in the same review. But success is not just about financial investment. It's about us also taking more calculated risks and pursuing bold, longer-term projects in science and technology. We're now seeing a new architecture in the UK central government, 
the uh, Prime Minister-led National Science and Security Council, the new National Technological Advisor role, and um, new uh, institutions. The National Security Strategic Investment Fund is accelerating the development of new national security capabilities through innovative market solutions. These are major steps on our journey. But perhaps most critically of all, it is also about recognizing the importance of international standards, the formal and informal rules created by the private sector, governments and international bodies that determine how most technologies today will be developed and operated into the future. Returning to my theme of values, it's no surprise that those international standards are being contested every day around the world by autocratic rivals like China. And the results of those discussions and debates matter to our prosperity, security and daily lives more than ever before. But to conclude, what keeps me awake most about China is not really China, it's about maintaining our own sense of purpose and dynamism. Our success in ST going forwards is about global science powers like the UK and US having confidence, investing in the future, innovating, and doing so with a broad range of allies and partners, such as those represented in this discussion today. We should be and are ambitious and confident in that future vision. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Paul. That's really very interesting. I took a good deal of notes. Uh, who designs, how protect, how develop, take calculated risks, uh, maintain our own capabilities, understand standards, uh, the importance of standards and the like. So we'll come back to all those issues um, because I think they, and they fit right in with what uh, Chris Inglis was talking about, which is we need to focus uh, both on the affirmative uh, capacity of cyber to enhance uh, life for ourselves, our populations, our, our countries. Uh, as well as to set up a system that assures the right kind of resilience uh, so that we're living in the world that we want uh, with the values that we want. Uh, so really well done. And uh, we'll come back to this in the questions. Um, the second speaker uh, is Isabel Hilton. And I just wanna make sure that Isabel is here on the line. Uh, are you here? Oh, there you are, sorry, go ahead. Isabel, you're up. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, it's it's always an enormous pleasure and privilege to take part in uh, in the forum's events. And I think that um, when I finished, uh, you will appreciate, I hope, how much I am in agreement with what's been said so far by Paul and Chris. Um, I mean, I don't really need to uh, tell. I've been asked to to look at what actually threatens us. Um, and I don't really need to tell this audience that China is using a substantial part of its uh, wealth to upgrade, and to expand its military power, with a particular emphasis on, on cyberspace, on marine capability, including submarine and aircraft car car carriers, since a large um, section of this um, of, of participants will be very, very well aware of this. And the transformation of the PLA from a huge, inefficient and corrupt land army to a modern fighting machine um, and combined with China's expanding influence and port acquisition, I, I think we must assume um, a greatly enhanced capacity to project force and an ambition to dominate and at least deny access to China's near abroad, at least in the first island chain. And, I, and none of that is a surprise. But what counts is the real capacity to execute and more importantly, um, the will to do it what would be the moment, the catalyst that would precipitate the use of force by China. And again, learned volumes have been written on this, and I, I'm not going to, uh, to repeat what's already been said. So instead, I, I really want to talk about the broader threat that China poses. Um, and it's a threat that's posed because of the nature of the Chinese system and the capacity that China's economic success has given it to deploy a wide range of less conventional tactics and methods in defense of its interests. Now, every nation tries to defend its interests. Our challenge is to decide at what point China's defense or pursuit of its own interests, or rather the party's interests become a threat to us, where legitimate activity ends and threat begins. And this combination of factors has the Chinese threat become something unlike any other um, that, that I can recall. I, I think it has. We, we grew accustomed in the post-war period to the assumption that communist regimes were economically inefficient, that we had few overlapping interests, and that given a choice, most people 
would choose the relative political liberties uh, of democracy over authoritarianism. Uh, there was never a long queue of would-be immigrants, for example, at any Soviet embassy. So how is China different? Well, there's still no long queue of aspirant immigrants, but the party today does lay claim to a degree of performative legitimacy at home. And in keeping with its more assertive international posture, increasingly sells that message abroad. China is democratic, the message goes, it's people's democracy and it works better than liberal Western democracy. It delivers sober and responsible leadership that governs with the best interests of the people at heart. Well, you might think that's not much of a threat, but if you're the Chinese Communist Party looking at the rather fragile state of liberal democracies, you might well feel, as Xi Jinping frequently asserts, that the tide of history has turned in your favor. I've often mentioned the United Front Work Department in this forum. That's party entity, described by Mao as the magic bullet. The United Front has seen its budget and its power increased under Xi Jinping, and it's been given authority over what was the party entity that looked after relations with overseas Chinese. And since then, there have been repeated statements to the effect that it is the patriotic duty of everyone of Chinese descent to support the motherland. And this has the unfortunate effect in times of tension of raising levels of mistrust and in effect painting a target on the back of overseas citizens and of people of Chinese descent. Not obviously, um, this, is, this is a question of trust, but who to trust? And ambiguity is a key weapon in Chinese strategy, be it in domestic legislation or in international relations. And there are some key factors I think we should remember. China's external politics are driven by its domestic challenges, and in many ways, as China has globalized, it's been obliged to replicate the instruments of control that help to maintain its power at home uh, in the wider world. And it's the job of the United Front to neutralize those that the party considers its enemies and to recruit allies who, consciously or unconsciously, will promote the party's interest. The party lacks the coercive power overseas that it has at home, but it has some powerful tools nevertheless, including its economic heft, its supply chain dominance, and the attraction of the domestic uh, market, which allows it to leverage areas of mutual interest into advantages for China. The United Front works in many ways and across many spheres, including, importantly, discourse control. It works amongst overseas communities, um, buying up Chinese language media that serve those overseas communities. And for non-Chinese populations, challenging critics through all means available, including millions of social media bots. Now, we don't have to look far. For example, the Free University of Amsterdam has only just noticed that a human rights center that is financially supported by China argues that all is well in Xinjiang. There's similar concern, by the way, about a center in Cambridge University and a number of respected think tanks. Penetrating elite circles is also a priority mission, and that includes targeting politicians with influence in key sectors in which China itself has interests, as we've seen in the UK recently in the case involving a white glove actor and quite large sums of money. The person concerned has moved freely in UK political circles for many years, liberally dispensing cash, collecting political intelligence and exercising influence. And this is an absolutely standard United Front operation. But it's important to remember that the aim is not to bring down the UK government or indeed the US government. China does maintain warm relations with um, the UK's rather small revolutionary parties, but even the most obtuse ambassador couldn't believe that they are particularly helpful. And anyway, China is so embedded in global markets, it needs stable partners. The aim rather is to neutralize liberal democracy as a threat, to weaken it, to discredit it, and to enhance the qualities that the party claims for the Chinese approach. Now you might think we do a good enough job ourselves at discrediting our own systems, but China is definitely happy to help. And what is China's advantage here? Well, it's that open systems have vulnerabilities and they depend for their strength on shared values. Just as the integrity of UK politics depends on what Professor Peter Hennessy has called the good chap theory, it all works provided politicians respect the norms. Now, China plays global markets and global rules in much the same way. 
as an unscrupulous politician can de defy the norms to consolidate a kind of power that would destroy democracy, China does something similar, undercutting in price to establish near monopoly positions in key sectors, making trade conditional on political compliance, seeking to undermine values by insisting on the superior uh, results of the Chinese system. The objective is to oblige trade partners to import Chinese censorship rules as a condition of doing business with the world's second largest economy. And that, in my view, is a more immediate and pervasive threat than China's undoubted growing military and technological prowess. Paul mentioned digital surveillance. Now that's, as we know, at saturation levels in China, all well documented, for example, in Xinjiang. How much is that a threat to us? Well, clearly the technology can be deployed um, anywhere, but it's, it's also, I think, instructive to look at China's anxieties about data. Uh, China lately, uh, it didn't stop the, uh, the flotation of Didi Chuxing on the New York Stock Exchange, but it completely sabotaged it uh, by, uh, by subsequent regulatory action at home. Because it was concerned about Didi's data uh, potentially being offshored. And what does that tell us about China's own data collection through the digital Silk Road, for example, or even Chinese e-bikes, e which are now ubiquitous in our cities, or the electric cars that will be here shortly? How granular do we have to get uh, to be sure uh, that data is not being collected for malign intent? Writing on the prospects of a Brexit uh, UK's relations with China, Professor Kerry Brown argued that if the UK chose to defend its values in its dealings with China, it would become a test case for how high uh, a political and security price a developed country with a democratic system will need to pay for deeper collaboration with China. I think that's a question that remains unanswered, but more relevant than ever. It is our commitment to our own values that is under threat here. Um, and that I think is uh, something that we should primarily be giving our attention to. I'm gonna pause there. There is another chapter to this, I think, which is about China's domestic vulnerabilities um, and the chances of, uh, of success in this. And I'd be happy to discuss that in the Q&A, but for now, I'm going to pause there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Uh, as always, really uh, extremely interesting. And I think uh, looking at some of the points as we go to the Q&A uh, that you've raised, uh, I think are, are very important. Uh, thinking about uh, what's really happening with the United uh, Front Work Department, uh, the issues with respect to uh, coercion of speech by others. Uh, we had a uh, obvious example a couple of years ago with the National Basketball Association, but there have been many other uh, sets of activities. Uh, coercion with respect to economics, uh, Lithuania, of course, is uh, facing some of those issues at the moment. Um, and there are a variety of other specifics uh, that I think we need to talk about. And maybe we can also come to the question, as you pointed out, uh, on the domestic side for China, about the concerns that they have with respect to uh, if you will, color revolutions, uh, something that they share explicitly also with the Russian government, that is to say the concerns. Uh, but with that, uh, let me turn to our third speaker. Um, and uh, Joyce Corral uh, has had numerous uh, outstanding positions. Uh, uh, and now I believe you're over uh, with Chris as the uh, Deputy National Cyber Director at the White House, if I have it correctly. Uh, over to you, Joyce. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. I'm actually one of um, a small handful of acting um, uh, deputies to, uh, to uh, Chris. And uh, you heard Chris's vision as he articulated it. And the, the rest of us are there to actually implement it. Um, and it's um, a, a, a very large vision, you know, which, which as one would expect. Um, so I'm actually going to address a couple of things um, um, related to you know, how we're going to move out on implementing. Um, but Mark had asked me to speak about um, China and data power that China has. And we've seen the pieces of legislation that China has passed recently regarding cybersecurity, you know, data, and uh, uh, personal information. And the, the direction that, that these pieces of legislation have gone have really locked down data and data flows within China. 
um, and are, are regulations being imposed upon all companies that are that are doing business in the country. So China will, will look to use data as a national asset. China views data as, as a power to help drive um, economic, economic growth and looks at data as a, as a means by which to um, uh, impose um, restrictions um, and, and regulations within his country. And we're gonna see China use data um, uh, in an extraterritorial, extraterritorial fashion as a way to um, influence um, trade, trade negotiations and, and other negotiations. Um, I, in today's context, um, for the last couple of years, um, you know, China has, um, uh, with the previous administration, seen um, uh, the use of tariffs in a very aggressive fashion. Um, and in the last couple of years, there are companies that are now um, making decisions to diversify their supp supply chain and actually moving out of China, um, such as Samsung, which I think in 2021 actually moved completely out of China uh, to other countries in the Asian region. Um, so we also see China uh, domestically um, faced by the same supply chain shocks that have faced, faced the world, um, where um, uh, there are labor, labor shortages because people are sick, can't go into work, or their um, uh, you know, places have been shut down. Um, the shortages in uh, microelectronics that affect numerous different industries, um, transportation delays. So a whole host of supply chain shocks um, are facing China. So I think we will see China begin to use data in a more aggressive manner. Um, and one concern, um, one concern I have is as China expands its repertoire of, of um, activities like theft of intellectual property and cyber breaches from a um, uh, uh, you know, illicit and illicit acquisitions um, means by which to acquire data, I think we're heading towards an environment where China will be able to conduct identity exploitation at scale with the vast amount of data that China will have act, has access to or will have access to. And I wanna share an example of, of a conversation I had with an industry colleague who has been doing business, uh, business um, on a communications product a project in Europe. And um, there are a couple of European countries involved and a Chinese company as well. And the negotiations are now fraught where the Chinese company is concerned that it's being kind of push, pushed out of, of, the, um, of the deal and has ramped up pressure on the Western companies. And a uh, recent conversation, the Chinese threatened the uh, Western uh, representative by saying, saying if, if you come with us and you join with us, you will be rich beyond your you know, wildest dreams. Um, but if you don't, you will personally pay. Not you know, your company will suffer, you will personally pay. So that's, that's an example of, of some concern about identity exploitation at scale. So I want to talk a little bit about um, things that um, uh, we are looking from an administration perspective and a national perspective um, to do um, that are tactical and a little more strategic in nature. So sticking to sort of the cyber theme, there are sort of three areas um, from a technical perspective and then broader from a resilience perspective, um, a couple of other issues. One of the, in, in our current environment of, um, uh, uh, where we have seen any, any number of breaches from software supply chain exploitation, we've recognized that um, uh, we need to have a better handle on identity and authentication. So how do we, you know, what do our values want to be to echo what Chris said, you know, as we look to think, you know, what is it that we want out of you know, the cyber environment? What is it that we want from um, a, a, a trusted identity environment? Um, you know, how much identity is, should be shared or, or how much identity should be preserved. You shouldn't have to share all types of information if you want to um, go to um, go to a bar where you just need to prove you're of a certain age. Um, from a competition perspective, you know, how, you know, um, when we develop standards, you know, are, are we creating an environment where um, there's equal competition so many businesses can compete versus um, just a few of the Goliaths that are out there. Um, from a standards perspective, what are the standards that we want? Um, from a privacy perspective, do citizens understand you know, what, their, what their privacy, what the privacy implications are of operating in different environments? So how do we come up with a, trust, a trustworthy digital identity um, that our, our measures of trust are shared with our allies? We also need to improve our data security and, and have cl a clear understanding of what we consider to be sensitive data. Um, there has been a lot of examination and change in uh, some of our, our regulatory um, tools like foreign direct investment 
with regard to sensitive data and healthcare data. Um, but genomic data right now, you know, hasn't met that official definition of sensitive data. It's, it's protected. The rationale for protecting that data is for, for privacy purposes and for theft of intellectual property. But should there also be a national security level of protection to, to, to drive that as well? If you lose a credit card, you can always get another credit card to replace that. If you lose your DNA, you know, there's no, no getting, you know, an extra set of, of uh, you know, that type of data. So how, we need to think through um, these types of challenges. Um, more recently, we have been looking at um, how um, open source software is developed and how open source software is used. And uh, we're taking some steps to um, uh, work with the private sector. The, the people who develop open source software are a, a small set of uh, players, but the software that is developed is the foundation of almost all technology um, technologies around the world that are broadly in use. So how do we, how can we have the um, uh, best investment in that, uh, working with those, working with those developers and working with the, the tool environment that, that um, uh, users who take advantage of open source software, how they ingest that in a secure way. Um, uh, this uh, last uh, two weeks ago, uh, the White House hosted a, an open source software summit and we'll continue to have uh, um, conversations to advance, advance uh, practices in this particular domain. From a more uh, strategic perspective, um, we are looking at um, uh, su supply chains and how the ecosystem of the technology ecosystem, how we are postured as a nation to be resilient in those supply chains. Um, when President Biden came in, one of the first, in the first set, set of executive orders that he issued, he issued one on America's supply chains. This is actually the first time in the US that we've actually done a deep dive on uh, how, how we source things in, across you know, numerous different areas, semiconductors, pharmaceuticals, advanced batteries, um, the energy sector. So we, we have accomplished a lot of research in this space and we recognize as well that in these different areas, all of these companies that produce goods and services are also digital companies. Um, you may have, folks may have followed um, last year the um, ransomware attack against the company and the Colonial Pipeline. The Colonial Pipeline thought they were a gas and oil company, and then they found out that they were actually a cybersecurity company. Um, so um, how are, you know, how companies have digital assets? So when we do our supply chain analysis and make decisions on whether we onshore or reshore or develop strategic partnerships with certain allies, you know, are we, we need to uh, att attend as well to safeguarding the IT and the data ecosystem of those, of those areas. And that's, an, er that's a, 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 um, an area of focus and a priority of the administration at this point. We're looking to these things as well to go back to um, uh, the notion of values that that everyone has has pressed on and what we want out of our um, uh, our our governance and, and how we develop technology. We also need to think through when we make these investments that they stand the test of time and that they stand um, through political change. So. You know, one one administration comes, another administration comes in. You know, are we are we investing in enduring activities? Because some of these things really will take a decade to to come to fruition. So I wanted to kind of close close with that. From a, a the, the final thing from a strategic perspective is of course an investment in education education and training. Um, and as Chris articulates it, he talks about you know the the few, the few, the many, the all. There are few people that really need to be um, uh, have very sophisticated cyber um, cyber skills. You know, these are the people who are developing technologies and running our networks. Um, and the many are are the people that need to know how to use these tools and systems. And the all, as everyone needs to know, you know how they can. Um, operate safely and have confidence in, in our digital networks and in our digital ecosystems. So with that, I'll close and turn it back to you, Frank, for Q&A.